Good morning, fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, thank you, Dick. <laughs> it's good to see everyone this morning. We welcome you this morning to the second Sunday after Pentecost. And a very special day at the church. We have a new member coming with us and a wonderful little addition. And his name is James Edward Johnson III. And we welcome him and his family this morning as he's baptized. As we're going through our service this morning, this is the blanket that was made, especially for little James. And we're going to pass this around so that everyone has a chance to lay hands on it, pray for him. And I would ask that you pass it so that it comes this way and comes back to me down here. So I'm going to pass it to John and then I'm going to pass it back to Teresa. She'll start it down okay. in the next row. Okay? It's so good to see everyone. I'd like to invite you to stand and join me as we come before God in our call to worship. And you'll find that call to worship in your bulletins. Come, let us gather in the awareness of God's love. God's love has brought us to this place. It has made of us a church. We can live with confidence and hope in the assurance that we are forgiven and accepted by a power greater than ourselves. Because we are forgiven, we too can forgive. Let, Let us praise, praise this God, God and, and, and offer our hearts to worship. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 710 in your black hymnal. In, I'm sorry, in your black United Methodist hymnal. And we welcome Jeff to join us as we follow the song. 710 in your hymnal, Faith of Our Father. Please join me. Our epistles 
scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Will you hear with me the word of God? So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. God sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Amen. We invite Jeff to join us as he comes to us with the song, Child of Blessing, Child of Then on, no one dare 
ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our next hymn can be found in your hymnals number 363. And can it be that I should gain? Please join me.
Leslie wrote the hymn that we just sang right after he experienced conversion. And I would suggest that if we just stopped with, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed me, that would be enough of a sermon. Because that's where we're headed today. And we're going to talk about Leslie and his conversion. Um, if you'll pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and set our hearts on fire. For our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you ever known something in your head, but haven't been able to feel it in your heart? If you answered yes to that, you're in very good company. It was the same situation that our founder, John Wesley and his brother Charles were struggling with. I had a request from someone that this year we observe Aldersgate Gate Sunday. So today we're going to take a look back some of our history and remember the events of a significant marker in Wesley's life that took, back, took place way back in May of 1738. Wesley was raised in a devout Christian home. He had served the Lord with devotion. He was faithful in his role as a pastor. Despite that, when he was 35 years old, he realized that the love of God was not in his heart. He wrote in his journal on January 8th of 38, that he didn't have any inward feeling of God's presence. He lacked what he wrote was an infallible proof of the witness of the Holy Spirit that he was saved. And he had not experienced a personal relationship with God through the mercy of Jesus Christ. If you've ever experienced a time when you faced a crisis of faith. You may remember it. It's a really painful experience. It causes you to wrestle, to wrestle with everything that you believe about faith, to the point that maybe you even have a sense that you're disconnected from God. It's those moments when you cry out, God, where are you? Why are you silent? As Wesley's story continues, it was an experience at sea that led John to confront his own personal crisis. John and Charles, they were both filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were excited. They were excited because they were going to be making their first journey to America. The year 1735, and they set out with the goal that John would serve as a minister a minister to a new parish in Savannah, Georgia. Assuming that he would preach to the Indians and convert them, John set sail to the harbor where persecuted religious sects and penniless debtors lived. But it wasn't smooth sailing. A storm began to develop. And I almost can see the same storm as Jesus and the disciples faced on the sea. The waves are coming up and it's treacherous. And the people on board thought that they were in danger of losing their very lives. They thought that the ship was going to split in half. That's how bad the storm was. And then what happened is John looked around and he saw that while most of the people were panicking. There was a group, and they were holding a worship service, and they were praising God, and they were praying, and they were singing hymns. This group was the Moravians. In the midst of this brutal storm, they had peace. They trusted God. And John, at that 
moment perceived that the love of God was in their hearts, and he wanted that. They did survive the storm, and John subsequently began meeting with a group of the Moravians for some spiritual direction and prayer. But that wasn't the end of Wesley's challenges. The result of his first mission trip, well, it was an absolute failure. Not only were his methods and his teaching rejected, but he had fallen in love with a woman. And he didn't rise up to ask her to marry him quickly enough. And she went off and married someone else. That led to a whole other set of problems, which is a story for another day. But when John left George in December of 37, he was never to return again. He was a failure, and his despair was overwhelming. Wesley was a broken man. At one point, he even wrestled with never preaching again until he could sort out all the struggles that he was experiencing with his faith. Peter Bowler, who was one of his Moravian mentors encouraged him with this. He said, preach faith till you have it, and then, because you have it, preach faith. But I'm struck by something pretty remarkable in these interactions John was having with this group. In his struggle, Wesley's struggle, not one of the Moravian guides told him to simply recite the sinner's prayer. No one told him to find an altar call to profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. They didn't prescribe shortcuts or formulas for attaining his faith. For them, as well as Wesley, we come to realize grace is a gift. It's a gift from God. We can do nothing to earn it because it's free. According to the Dean of the United Methodist Historians, grace is the power of God working in each of us, sometimes in spite of us, to help each of us live a different life than we would be living if God left us to our own devices. Pretty powerful. In a journal excerpt, Wesley shares that on the evening of May 24th, he went very unwillingly, and those are his words, he didn't want to go. He was broke there. Unwillingly, he went to a society in Aldersgate Street in London. Someone was standing reading the Luther's practice to the Epistle to the Romans. He's very specific. He says, about a quarter to nine. While he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, he felt his heart strangely warmed. And at that moment, he realized that he did trust in Christ. He trusted in Christ alone for his salvation. And that strange work led him to know with absolute certainty that God had justified him. Wesley was overcome with a renewed relationship with Jesus. It's been said that that is the day that he finally joined the human race. He finally received what Jesus had been trying to give him all along. And so it is with us. Jesus wants to give us life to the full through our relationship with him. John Wesley, up until that moment, had never really felt worthy of forgiveness. He felt that he would never do enough to earn God's favor. He had never been able to simply live 
in the joy of a relationship with God. But on that night, Wesley's heart warmed and it, it melted the unforgiveness that he had been holding on to. He let the light of Christ into his heart. He realized that he was like everyone else, one for whom Christ had died, just like Jesus died for each of us. Now, he was able to accept that for himself. The thing is that Wesley knew all these things about Christ. He was a preacher. He was a student. But it was Aldersgate Day. That was the day he let it travel from his head to his heart. Patterson, who's the general commission on archives and history, puts it this way. I think he came to his adulthood with one particular concept of how the religious life should work for him. And I think that's what he had to relearn. He had initially planned to live life in a certain way, and that was going to make a great relationship with God. And what Aldersby taught him was he had to flip it. He'd gone unintentionally the cart before the horse. End of quote. His trust in Jesus for salvation became his message to the masses. Wherever Wesley traveled over the next 53 years, he would proclaim what he himself had experienced on that evening in May. Now here's the sad part. The church didn't want him, and the church didn't want his message. His theology wasn't in line with theirs. His theory of grace that God's love is free and it's for all didn't line up with what they were preaching. His love was too extravagant. His methods were too unorthodox. He disobeyed the authority of the church and he openly defied their structures. What happened? They kicked him out of churches. He had no pulpit. So he stood in the fields. He went to the markets. And he even preached in the cemetery where his dad was buried. Until his dying day, he begged the people of the Methodist movement to stay and fight for the whole church to be awakened by the fire of God's movement. Wesley says when we look trustingly to God, that love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then we're able to pour our hearts with love for God and for friends and for strangers and even our enemies. God is breathing his spirit, his life, his love, his mercy, his holiness into us, into our souls, into our very being. And in response, we're breathing back with thanksgiving and praises and adoration and intercessions for people around us. By this, the life of God is distinct in our souls. God acts, we react. It's kind of a spiritual respiration. We go back and forth, we breathe in, we breathe out. When we love this way, we rejoice in God. Our delight is in the Lord. He is the one who fills us with joy and a hunger to do God's will. Today we're going to celebrate a couple of minutes James' baptism. Yeah, you're almost waving at me. That's the first step that we each take in the lifelong journey that we call faith. Wesley, he left us with ways to support our growth in faith. He emphasized that we use what he referred to as ordinary means of grace. Those things that we do which help us to understand, to receive, to be filled with God's love. On his list, 
are reading and meditating on scripture, fasting, attending worship, attending to the sacraments of the church, and what we call Christian conferencing. That's when we get together, we talk, we wrestle with our faith. It's when we walk with each other. He says it's also necessary that we do good works, that we do things that represent Jesus to the world. At his structure, out of his encouraging the practices of the means of grace through the Methodist churches. Yet, all of that is just where we started. <coughs> but they are also what we need to sustain and continue to live into what we were created to be. A church which stops at nothing to tell each other how much God loves them and what Jesus did for each of us. May the Lord warm our hearts with his love over and over and over again until we're full to overflowing and have no doubt that we are beloved child of God. And may we give thanks to God for this journey called faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Quick announcement. On the back table, and thanks be to John, who's been working so hard, she's redone our directory. So she's asked if you just stop and look over your name and make sure that all the information is correct before she goes to final print. And also, there's a birthday list on there if you want to add your birthday so we can embarrass you as an <laughs> Do we have other announcements? Speaking of, we do have to embarrass some people uh, with a happy birthday singing. So we have Suzette and Dan uh, and Patrick and as well. are coming up this week, right? You won't be here next week. I will not be here. All right. So happy birthday to our pastor and to Suzette. All right. Happy birthday. Resourceful Holy Spirit of God. We thank you for your servants, John and Charles Wesley, that you fueled their passion, that you strengthened their faith with your divine grace, bringing them through dark times, both enlightened and renewed. We would ask, Lord, that you warm our hearts too. 
that we would leave this time of worship with the renewed assurance that through your grace we are saved through the gift of Jesus the Christ. Shape us. Shape us in your holiness. Enable us as you did then to fulfill your purposes that speak of hope and mercy and justice for all. Lead us out of this church into those places where people need to hear how extravagant you love. God, you know all things before we even speak. You know our needs. So you have heard the pleadings of our hearts for Eleanor and her family and friends who are saying their last goodbye. We give thanks that you have gone on and prepared a place for each of us when it is our time. We thank you for resurrection, both here and in the future. We pray for those that are wrestling with new diagnoses of, of cancer and other illnesses, that you would give wisdom to treatment teams and lead a path to recovery. We pray, Lord God, in this time of where finances stretch many to the limits, that you would open doors, that you would be the vision so that people can see how we help each other. We know, Lord God, that you always are with us. So please walk with this person who's struggling. Allow them to know your care and concern. May we know, Lord God, that you both fill us and then ask us to pour out to others that whatever our situation or condition, we call us to serve and honor Jesus. And we know, Lord God, that the best of all, as Leslie would say, is God is with us. We give thanks to you, our Redeemer and Sustainer, as we pray the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and glory forever. Amen. I invite Jessica to come forward. Um, and you will see in your bulletin, you have a couple of inserts. The first is the reception to membership. That's on a single page. That's your response um, in our support of, of Jessica. So I'll let her first come forward and Shelly, if you want to join us. Sally, could we ask whoever has the blanket? If they I have a blanket. You have it. All set? Yeah. Take a deep breath. I know you're nervous. <gasps> Breathe in, grace. Breathe out, grace. That's how it goes. That's the respiration. Breathe in, breathe out. In and out. On behalf of the whole, oh, that was good. That was a good one. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil? Injustice and oppression, whatever form they present themselves. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the Church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministry? Church family, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and commitment to Christ? We do. We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Jessica in your care? We do. 
You are right. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Jessica with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her trust with God and be found faithful in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in a way that leads to life. Jessica, as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend Jessica to your loving care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks, thanks for, for all that God, God has already given you, and we, and we welcome, welcome you in Christian love. As, as members, members together with you in the body of Christ, Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew, renew our covenant to faithfully participate in the ministries of the Church by our, our prayers, presence, presence gifts, gifts or service, and our witness, that in everything God will be glorified through Jesus Christ. May the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. 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 Now I'm going to look you that. <laughs> and I invite you all to come up now. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
Give him a few seconds.
this morning. We've been blessed to have a new member of the church. We've been blessed to enjoy the baptism of James and the fellowship of his family. We need to be grateful to share what has happened this morning, to let people know what a wonderful gift this is, a gift to the family of God, from the family of God. Will you join me in the benediction? Now, as we go from this place, may you be our heart, our mind, our steps, our hands, and our, our mouths as we share with you the love of Jesus Christ in all that we do, in everywhere we go, and in everything we say and do. May it be done in your honor and in your name. Go with the love of God into the world, knowing that in all we are and in all you have made us, we will honor you. Amen. 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 Just a reminder, please stay. There's a beautiful gate in the back. Come and join us.